All right, it's me again, your host. <clears throat> and next, if you may recall from what was to me last night, uh, I said I was going to cover a concept that's going to include some of these uh, characteristics right here from neoclassical economics. It is, in fact, called no, the dog's in here because Melanie is at work. The loanable funds theory of interest. And as I said uh, last night, or perhaps to you moments ago, the uh, reason I want to cover this is one, because I want to show you uh, an example of a neoclassical model. Uh, it's, it's easy to go through the list, but then you're like, okay, but what would that look like? All right, so I'm going to give you an example. I want to give you an example that illustrates in particular the idea that the economy tends to be self-regulating, that it tends to fix itself, and that's what this is. Uh, and then third, I have something in my eye. And then fourth, uh, this will be directly contrasted with something later that Keynes said that was in opposition to this, so I wanted to bring it into evidence now, so we can then compare it later. All right. So, Lovable Funds Theory of Interest. And let's get started here. Okay, usually this takes me a little bit in class, uh, and so it will here too, because I need to do a little bit of background first. And that background involves macroeconomics. And the idea that total... expenditures in a closed system must, I may zoom in a little bit more, sorry, I'm just now, it's like 7.17 in the morning, Melanie had to get up at 5.30 to go to work, and I was going to go ahead and sleep some more, but then the dog said, no, no, let's get up, stupid jerk, all right, anyway, so I thought, well, I'll go ahead and get started on videos, uh, maybe a bit more, yeah, yeah, because I don't care if I see the frame of the... Okay. Ouch. And you see how it's still zooming in? I don't know why it does that. There must be some fascinating technological reason, but I don't want it to. I have to turn off some sort of auto thing, I guess. Okay, back out. All right, that'll work. Will it? Oh, sorry. Dag nabbit. I'm going to move it a little bit more. <sighs> Wrong way. All right. Please don't continue to adjust on my computer or uh, camera. It did not this time. Okay. Um, and is that how far? Well, I can't reach that far anyway. It's going to it's going to stop about in there. All right. Okay. In a macro economy, in a closed system, total expenditures must be equal to total income, which must be equal to total output. It logically must be true because, for example, every time you make an expenditure, it becomes somebody else's income. And every time you get income, it's because someone made an expenditure. And if you're making an expenditure, it's for something. So those dollar values have to all add up to the same thing. And in fact, if you have had intro macro, you may have learned that there's what they call expenditures approach and income approach in calculating GDP. In other words, they calculate G uh, GDP by adding up everybody's income, and then they also calculate it by adding up everybody's expenditures. because. They've got this data, right, when you turn in your uh, income taxes. And then they've got these data from firms. Firms tell them how much they sold. And theoretically, they should be the exact same number. Now, they never are because people round stuff off, people lie, and this sort of thing. But they know that logically they should be the same number, and they, and they want to double check it. Uh, so, not only is this something that is relevant in theory, heck, even in practice we actually employ this concept right here. Again, the idea that in a closed system, in a macro economy, uh, that every time you make an expenditure, you know, when do you make an expenditure that it doesn't become some other entity's income? I mean, that is by definition what you're doing. When you're standing at the, in the grocery store and you've pushed your cart of stuff up there and they've slid it across the little uh, laser that, that figures out all the prices, when you run your card through the credit card machine, you just made an expenditure. 
but to the grocery store, that transaction was income. And for what? For the stuff in the cart. In fact, these are simply three ways of looking at the exact same transaction. Every individual transaction generates a number that's called expenditures, which is when you spend the money. Uh, every single one generates income. For the, again, uh, I shouldn't say it that way. It's the same transaction. It just depends on which side of the register you're standing on. If you're standing on the non-cash register side, it was an expenditure. If you're standing on the cash register side, it was income. And the stuff in the cart is the output. So every individual transaction, you write down the, the same number three times. Okay. Now, so that's very, that turns out to be very important to this and to the concept we're going to cover later that I told you is in contradiction to this particular theory. Uh, now. Let's see. Again, if you had macro already, uh, you, this, you may find this familiar, but we're going to use y for basically gross domestic product, or the total dollar value of all goods and services uh, produced and sold in the U.S. in a given year or a given quarter or whatever. Um, so we're going to use y. We're not going to write GDP every time. We're just going to put y up there. And, and second, sometimes I'll refer to y as total income. Sometimes I'll refer to it as total expenditure, and sometimes I'll refer to it as total output. And now you know why, because it's all the same number. And depending on the context, it might be more convenient to refer to it as income in one context, expenditure in another, and income in another. But I'm allowed to call, and you know, and being a senior faculty member, uh, when I have visited uh, younger faculty members' classrooms, I've noticed this is something you've got to be really careful about when you're teaching the intro macro class, is to make sure everyone's clear on the idea that uh, why you're allowed to refer to why in three different ways. Because it can be very confusing to students. We're used to it. But almost you're sitting there thinking, I thought the professor said that was expenditure, and, and now she's referring to it as income. What the hell? Uh, so... And this is why. This is why. Because every individual transaction generates three ledger entries, if you will. And again, my point here is that I'm going to refer to Y sometimes as income, sometimes as expenditure, sometimes as output, depending on what's going to be most helpful to you in that context uh, to think about it. But it's all the same number. But wait, there's more. Let's think about it as expenditure for a moment. The way we calculate expenditures, the way we define GDP, is it's composed of four different kinds of expenditures. Consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. How much we sold minus how much we bought, right? Net exports. So that's how we calculate GDP uh, every year. We add up consumption expenditures plus investment expenditures plus government expenditures plus net exports. And of course, all this is creating income at the same time, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, now, let's see here. This includes, you know, uh, both the federal government, state and local, any kind of, any kind of government spending. Uh, and this is, of course, you know, what we sell to people in other countries minus what we bought from them. Um, we're going to keep it simple with this analysis right here. We're going to get rid of the government and get rid of foreigners. Every Texan's dream come true. And so, we're going to deal with just these two right here. Just the sort of like a pure private sector economy. There's no government uh, involvement in the economy and none of them dang foreigners messing everything up. All right. So we're going to do just C plus I. And now let me explain what C and I are, if I may. Okay. Consumption expenditures. Uh, let's see here. This here was a consumption expenditure. My cellular phone uh, and my Cincinnati Reds baseball cap was a consumption expenditure. Anything that the household is buying for its own personal use uh, is going to be a consumption expenditure. Right? So that's the vast majority of what you're familiar with. You go out to a restaurant, consumption expenditure, uh, and, and so on. Um, however, when TCU bought this, that was investment. 
And you want to be clear on what this investment means right here. It doesn't mean buying stocks and bonds, right? That, that, that's, actually, um, that's actually a form of savings. That this is Look, I drew a factory. Uh, this is like building factories. All right? it, th this kind of spending is like building factories. This is, in, this is physical investment. As opposed to financial investment. All right? So, uh, financial investment doesn't directly create jobs and income. Physical does. If I'm going to build a new restaurant, that's going to create a bunch of jobs. If I'm going to add on to uh, TCU's campus, that's going to cre create a bunch of new jobs. Uh, so, physical investment. Now, uh, what falls under the category? So, so, only firms do physical investment. Only firms do this. What falls under that category? Well, um, anything that see how did I used to define this I had a good definition I made up for one of my classes anything that contributes to the ability to produce output but which doesn't become part of Output. That all fit? Yeah, it did. Okay. You're making a physical investment expenditure as a firm, as an entrepreneur, uh, as a uh, member of the board at TCU. Whenever you purchase anything that contributes to your ability to produce output, but doesn't become part of the output, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. What about when they when they buy raw materials? But we're not counting raw materials here. This is investment spending for TCU when they buy these. It's not a building, but it doesn't matter. These are things that contributed to the ability. I mean, heck, I'm using them right now. Producing the output that TCU sells, right? So this enables me, this helps me produce the output. But when you graduate, the chancellor does not hand you your diploma and here's a pen. All right? So this doesn't become part of what you take with you. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about a restaurant. Uh, at, at a restaurant, if the tableware you use is metal, you're not supposed to take it with you, right? You're supposed to leave it there and they clean it, right? Uh, that would be when, when, when the restaurant buys the tableware, uh, I, I guess, well, I'm avoiding the word silverware for a reason, um, tableware, uh, that is physical investment because that's going to help them produce restaurant meals, but you don't get to take it with you. What about if you're at a place where they give you plastic utensils? Well, that's not investment spending anymore because that you take with you. That is part of the product they're selling, all right? You take the, uh, um, you, you know, at, at Kentucky Fried Chicken, the, the, the spork, one of the most brilliant inventions of all time, the spork, uh, you get to take it with you. So in that case, when, when um, Kentucky Fried Chicken buys sporks, uh, or foons, as I believe they're called in the South, uh, uh, sporks, then um, that is not an investment expenditure. It's only things that don't become part of the output. All right, so this, TCU purchased this for me, all right, to use. Uh, and it is because in order to do my job. What else we got in here? Uh, the eraser. TCU bought that, and it doesn't become part of the output. Now, let's see. On the other hand, the paper that they print your diploma on, that's not investment spending because you take that with you, all right? You, you get to keep that. Um, all right, so that's what investment spending is. If you always think to yourself, it's a factory, then that's not exactly right because it's much more than factories, but you'll never go wrong. So let me say that again. If you always think of physical investment as building a factory, you'll always come to the right conclusions about what physical investment is. It's actually much broader than that because it includes this. But nevertheless, if you want to make sure that you're, you know, don't, don't sit there and worry yourself over, well, gosh, is so-and-so investment? Is so-and-so physical investment? Uh, no, no, no. Just think of a factory, all right? Now, what about the stuff that does become part of the output? What about uh, at a Mexican restaurant, you order fajitas, what about the chicken? What about the chicken? 
that it, when when the Mexican restaurant buys the the uh, raw un, you know uh, well I was gonna say raw uncooked that's the same thing isn't it the raw chicken then that's not physical investment for them and it's also not a consumption expenditure so where does it fit in it actually does fit under consumption expenditure because it is a raw material for what they're going to sell you what you're going to take with you inside your stomach presumably but what you're going to take with you so it becomes part of what when they buy chicken it becomes part of consumption and we don't need to ask the mexican restaurant how much did you spend for the chicken we don't need to know that all we need to know is what they charge for the fajita all right because the fajita includes all the ingredients from all the things they bought to create the fajitas and now you got the tortillas you got the onions and so forth um, that's all inside there so we only measure the cost of the fajitas we don't bother it with the sort of things that fed into the fajita because presumably the restaurant charged you for what it cost them to get the chicken now there may be individual instances where that turns out not to be true because the company was going under and they're selling stuff under cost but in general at a macro level we're like look at the macro level when Hewlett Packard uh, sold this to TCU, they charged TCU for all the internal components that they had to buy from someone else, and then they get, and then they also added on a profit. Right? Uh, so uh, we don't bother to take account of raw materials separately, because the raw materials that feed into consumption goods, for example, well, they're already in the price of the final consumption goods. All right, so we don't need to worry about that. We don't need to worry about once again. We don't need to worry about how much it cost the Mexican restaurant to buy the raw chicken because they charged you that amount plus when you bought the fajitas. So, going back to this, in this simplified world, there's only two kinds of final expenditures, all right? Final expenditures, consumption goods and investment goods. When consumers buy consumption goods or services, we put the number here. When firms build a new factory, we put the number over here, all right? Okay, uh, in, our, in our simplified world. Now think about this, okay? So we're thinking about this as expenditure. Now think of it as income. There's only two things you can do with income. You can spend it or save it, you know, consumption or savings. Uh, notice there's no taxes here because we got rid of the government. So consumption and savings are the only two things you can do. <gasps> Those of you who are math majors just noticed, mon dieu, as they say in French math classes. Well, then it must be true that investment equals savings. Because remember, these two are the exact same number. This is expenditures. This is income uh, and I'm sorry I should say oh yeah I'm sorry no that, that's okay uh, expenditures are either consumption expenditures or investment expenditures and then once you have your income what can you do with it you can either spend it or consume with it or you can save it so investment and savings must end up being the same number and that's right it does if if we get rid of of the government sector and the um, uh, uh, foreign trade the same concept that I'm about to go through would still be true, but it would be more complicated to explain it, all right? So that's why we're going to just deal with this simple scenario right here. Now, there are no economists on the face of the earth, there was one guy, but we killed him last year, um, who disagree that this is true. Sure, no problem. Sure, no problem. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, there's not going to be any disagreement over that among all the various schools of thought. What there is disagreement about, and, and, and listen carefully to this, what there is disagreement about is the process by which they are equated. How do they come to rest at equality is the question. And in this, in this neoclassical model I'm going to show here, the process by which they return to equality, if ever they're knocked out of equality, the process by which they return to equality is a nice happy one because it ends up keeping us at full employment, keeping us at a point where everyone who wants a job has a job. And, and let me illustrate here. Okay, uh, now we're, well, let's see. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all in the book again, but I'm going to give you more detail here. Let's see. And I'll, I'll probably show you that in a minute, too. Okay. I'm going to make five assumptions about the way this world works here that I'm going to lay out. And let me sort of bullet these over here. Uh, only households... Uh-oh. I'll, I'll move the camera up in just a second. Only... Households earn income and save. Move that up a little bit so I can see that. <laughs> yep, I'm going the wrong way. Let me see how that looks on the monitor. Got to get out of the way because it's trying to focus on me. And, and why wouldn't it? Uh, okay, yeah, a little bit more, actually. In fact, I may just... Yeah, let's just do that. Okay. Only households earn income and save. So we're, we're going to assume, for simplicity, that firms don't retain earnings. They do in real life, but let's pretend they don't for simplicity. Uh, and uh, just to sort of start off with a simple story here. Only firms borrow and invest. All right, so, and firms have to borrow to invest if they don't keep any income. They don't have any money left over. So if they're going to invest, if they're going to build a factory, then they have to uh, go to the bank and borrow some money. Come on, uh, camera, quit doing that. I, I think it's because, okay, I'll try to get completely out of shot here. It's trying to decide what it should be focusing on. Okay, um, next one. Savings is a positive function of the interest rate. When interest rates go up, people save more. When interest rates go down, people save less. So plus means same direction. It doesn't mean up. It means same direction. When R goes up, S goes up. When R goes down, S goes down. So we're going to assume that people are willing to save more when they are rewarded more for saving. Oops, I wrote that a little bit too close. Oh, and now I'm just an idiot. All right, let's see. Investment is a negative function of the interest rate. Uh, if firms have to borrow this money in order to invest, then when it's costlier to borrow the money, when this goes up, this goes down. And when it's cheaper to borrow the money, when this goes down, that goes up. So negative sign here means opposite direction. And here's our fifth important assumption. The financial sector. Financial sector pays are on I have to get down over here and do this on household how close am I getting oh uh, I'm sorry on household s so they pay interest on household saving and what have I got here earn interest on yeah and earn are on Firms borrowing to invest. All right. What's the financial sector do in this situation? Uh, it pays interest on household savings, and then it earns interest on firms borrowing to invest. All right. So this is the world that we're setting up here uh, in this neoclassical model. Uh, and there are some simplifying assumptions, which is always true. There's no way we can go through, I mean, if the real world were uh, so simple that we could make everything exactly realistic, then we probably wouldn't need the economics discipline to try to model it. Uh, but it isn't like that. It's, it's too complicated. Uh, so here's what's going to be going on in this world. Banks are going to be trying to attract enough household saving up here to be able to have the money in their vaults that they then turn around and loan out to firms for investment. 
And one of the goals, I guess I could add this as another uh, assumption here, but I don't. Uh, one of the goals here is to not have money just sitting in the vault. Why? Because they pay interest on the savings, all right? So they don't want the, they don't want the money sitting in the vault. Uh, and so maybe you can see here already what's going to happen is they're going to have the incentive to whenever S isn't equal to I, to make S equal to I. Because they don't want any money sitting in the vault that isn't being borrowed. And furthermore, if there's an increase in the demand for investment loans, well, they want to bring some more money in. They want to make sure, because, and by the way, of course, um, this interest rate and this interest rate are not the same one. You know, they, they are paying less than they are earning on firm, um, uh, on firm borrowing. And so they're making money off the spread between those two interest rates. But, it's, you know, if you're in a money and banking class, maybe you want to you know, talk about that. But here, here, all we're worried about is movements in the interest rate. No, these are not the same interest rate, but they're going to move the same direction. Almost always move the same direction. If they are paying more for household savings, they're going to charge more for firms to borrow money. And if they are paying less, then competition among banks will force them to offer less in, uh, you know, to, to charge less in interest down here. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, let's say we start off here. So, that, that, that finishes that. Start at S equals I and full employment. All right. Let's just say for sake of argument, we start off in a situation where everything's great. Uh, or as uh, Emmett Bukowski would say, gosh, what is it that he says? Um, everything is, oh man, I can't believe I can't remember that from the Lego movie. Uh, you're probably sitting there right now saying, you, you moron, it's so-and-so. Um, let's see. Uh, so we start off where everything is awesome, where everything is awesome, all right? We're at savings is equal to investment and full employment, the world is great. Now let's say that firms decide, for whatever reason, to lower investment. So firms decide not to borrow as much for investment this period, which, by the way, happened before the Great Depression. There was a big collapse in investment. Uh, so this potentially could be a huge problem. This could cause a recession. And uh, the question is, well, now what happens? You know, well, uh, what does this set into motion in the world that's described up here? Does there now result a recession? Is it not? Is it not true? Let me read that study question to you again. From or not study question, but uh, where is it? Right here. Sorry, I need page eight, and I have apparently taken them out of order. Uh, for eight. All right. Remember. Under the modern characteristics of neoclassicism, free markets is natural and benevolent. The uh, belief that, generally speaking, free markets are best and the economy takes care of itself, all right? That we don't need government intervention, we don't need, uh, that, that it's going to automatically return itself to full employment, don't worry. So, this th recession threatens here, right? Okay, well, what happens next is that if I'm the banker, then I'm in a situation where now, Savings is greater than investment. The amount of money I'm paying on, uh, paying to depositors is still the same as it was before we started. But I'm earning less money from borrowers. So I'm unhappy about this. I've got money just sitting in the vault that no one is borrowing. This is costing me money and I'm making nothing off of it. I want to get rid of those loanable funds, which is the way that, where the name of this uh, particular model comes from. I want to get rid of those loanable funds. I want to make sure somebody borrows them. So how do I figure out a way to make somebody borrow them? And actually, i got two goals here. I want to make sure people borrow more and deposit less. All right. So e either one's going to fix my problem. All right. Either one's going to fix my problem. Well, I'm going to lower the interest rate. I'm going to lower the interest rate because that's going to, that, that's going to address my problem. Uh, lowering the interest rate is going to increase investment, because if this goes down, that goes up, and it's going to lower savings. If this goes down, that goes down. So it will move them back to equality, because for me, equality is the ideal situation, because that way I'm loaning out every penny that's in the vault. Ouch. So, uh, now when you lower the interest rate, let me move my chair out of the way here. 
uh, when you lower the interest rate, I'm going to have to do a little bit of an long arrow out here to get away from my S greater than I. Uh, that's going to, as I've already said, it's going to raise investment and lower savings. And remember, if you're not saving, then you must be consuming. So if those, if those households decided, if those households decided, uh, hey, let's save less, that's the same thing as, hey, let's spend more. And this process continues until savings equals investment again. Um, so I'm going to lower the interest rate. How far am I going to lower? I'm going to lower it till they're equal again. All right? that, that, the only point at which I'm going to be satisfied again is going to be when savings is equal to investment. And check this out. The pro now, recession threatened, right? I'm going to write that right there. Recession threatens. A recession threatens because investment fell. Well, so, but then entirely out of my own self-interest as the banker, I'm not thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I need to stop the recession. No, I'm just, I'm just looking at my, at my income and expenditures, and I'm thinking, this sucks. I'm paying the same on savings, but I'm earning less on firms borrowing, so I should do something about this in my own self-interest. Nothing to do with the rest of the world. And yet, and yet, my action in my own self-interest solves a problem for the rest of the world. Because both of those are reinvigorating spending. Reinvigorates spending. All right, uh, we can barely see that. Spending goes back up. Uh, the action I take reverses the decline in spending. The only question we haven't addressed here, which I will in a moment, is, is this increase equal to this increase? And it is. I'm sorry, decrease. Decrease. Uh, is this increase right here of the same magnitude of that decrease? Because if it's not, then we still have a problem. Uh, and we can't go, you know, we're, we're not back to full employment. We're not back to the point at which people, uh, everyone who wants to work has a job, um, and which is what full employment is, uh, roughly speaking. So the only question we haven't answered here is, is this going to be the same magnitude as this? And uh, there's two ways to explain why the answer is yes. Uh, and let me do the easy one first. Okay. Uh, and this is what I do when it's actually normal times at TCU. Uh, I'm looking out at the classroom. Let's see, let me get kind of in the middle here. Uh, I'm looking out at the classroom and I say, okay, this half of the class, I got to keep my hands in here. This half of the classroom, uh, you're the households. This half, you're the firms, all right? Uh, and let's say that right now, you folks are saving as much as you folks are borrowing for investment. But then, uh, and everything's great, right? Everything's awesome. Uh, then, the uh, for me, the right hand side, out of the classroom, uh, lowers the amount of investment they want to undertake. So that creates that gap right there, right? This is how much I, as the, I'm the banker now, this is how much I'm spending uh, interest on. I'm having to pay these people and I'm earning from these people. I got th that gap right there is how much money that's doing nothing for me that's just sitting in the vault. So what I want to do is I want to lower the interest rate. Well, the interest rate is going to cause this to come back up. Not all the way. There's no reason to believe that the interest rate fall. In fact, you'll see why in a second. Because we don't need it to go all the way back up. Because while this is going up, that's coming down. And remember, I'm not going to stop until they're equal again, right? So however big the gap is to start with, however big the gap is to start with, my incentive is to lower interest rates until the entire gap is gone. And whether that gap is gone by raising investment or lowering savings, I don't really care. Uh, I'm just trying to get rid of the money that's sitting in the vault. But however big that gap is, and that gap is this. However big that gap is, when I lower the interest rate, it's going to cause investment to come back up. Right there. 
It's going to cause investment to come back up and savings to come down, which is the same thing as saying consumption going up, right? So yes, absolutely. If the gap is initially this big, if the fall in investment is this big, then absolutely the increase in investment and the increase in consumption will be exactly that big. Why? Because my goal is to get rid of all the money sitting in the vault. How much money is sitting in the vault? This much. So investment comes up and savings comes down until they're equal again. And savings going down is the same thing as consumption going up. Dang! Ain't that kind of interesting? Uh, and let me now show you here, you may want to pause the video and jot all this down, but let me show you the, 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 uh, what I have typed out here uh, in my lecture notes to explain this. Da, 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 da. Ah, but I guess this speaks poorly of me. But I've been looking forward to this since last night. Uh, I've been looking forward to explaining this. Uh, I, I really enjoy, even theories I don't think are true, are fun to explain. So, which by the way happens to be true of this theory. I don't think it's right, but it's really fun to explain. Okay, so if you want to pause the video there and jot all that down, uh, the summary statement is just kind of saying, you know, well, uh, basically what we're going to say here in this model is, that when interest rates, uh, I'm sorry, that interest, the changes in interest rates will restore investment equal savings. And more than that, at the full employment level. So there's the five uh, assumptions. Let me, have I got a pen here handy? Yeah, I do. Let me put a little bullet point, point on all those. I don't have it that way in my notes, but. There. There's the five bulleted points and then the analysis started S equals I full employment. Now say firms decide to lower investments such as I is such that I is less than S and recession threatens, causes a problem for the financial sector since they're now earning less from firm borrowing but paying the same on household savings. They lower interest rates to encourage the former and discourage the latter. This leads to where the rise in consumption is exactly the same size as the net fall in investment. Because there's a net fall in investment, right? Investment falls and then comes back up some, but it still leaves a gap. But that's okay, consumption takes up the gap. Therefore, the fall in the interest rate has the effect of reinvigorating spending exactly as much as it would have fallen, thereby avoiding recession. Returning to page eight. The belief that generally speaking, free markets are best in the economy takes care of itself. And that's what just happened here. That people's own self-interest kept us at full employment. All right? There may have been a temporary deviation away from it, but the economy is always working its way back towards full employment. Uh, hey, I just thought here, okay, I want to show you one more thing there, and, and I just thought here to um, read something to you off what they call the internet. Control-Alt-Delete. I'm so ashamed of my password. It's the name of a French city with various symbols included and so forth. And I misspelled it. So every time I type it in, I feel embarrassed because I know that's not how it's spelled. And I want here uh, Christina Romer um, and uh, Business Cycle. Okay, I'll look that up in a second. All right, so I told you there's, I told you there's two ways to show this the fact that this black line here, that those two are equal. Here's the second way to do it. If, if this were an advanced macro class, I, I teach a class on business cycles uh, that is, that requires intermediate macro. Uh, so you already have to have had intermediate macro first, and so it's like an advanced macro class. Uh, and and guess what? We actually talk about the real world. Real world expansions and recessions. Uh, now what's shocking is Nikon major to see us talking about the real world, but we do. And in that class, I'm not going to go over this in great detail, but I just want to show you what you do if we model this formally. Because everything I drew on the board just now, we can just do this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to measure both savings and investment on this axis down here. I'm going to measure the interest rate up here. And then I can put here a savings function, which is exactly what, that's just what we did a minute ago. Savings is a positive function of the interest rate. Interest rates go up, savings goes up. And then I'll do investment. 
which is a negative function of the interest rate. Now, notice here we started off, let's see, I guess I'll continue to do this part in black. I sub zero equal S sub zero. R sub zero. Okay, so we start off, uh, and let's just say we're at full employment uh, as, as our uh, initial assumption. Uh, savings equal to investment at this interest rate. But then remember what I said in the previous example, oh no, firms decide to invest less. Investment prime. And so for a time, until the interest rate adjusts, Savings is still at S sub zero, but investment is now at I sub one. And so this is that situation where investment is less than savings. Uh, again, you don't have to follow this, but I just want to show you how, uh, you know, so, some people have already had intermediate macro, and, and you might be interested in this. And let's see, I have a text from Melanie. Okay, uh, I wanted to know if she wanted me to boil some eggs for her lunch this week. She says no. Uh, so now what's happening is those, those, uh, um, Financial institutions are saying, well, crap, we're paying interest on this, we're earning interest on this, let's lower the interest rate. And how far are they going to lower the interest rate? To there. Let's call that R sub 2. And I'm not quite going to have room to write this. I sub 2 equals S sub 2. So notice they're going to be equal again. That as you bring the interest rate across, and when you hit the investment curve, it's here. When you hit the savings curve, it's here. So savings and investment must be equal again. And then notice then that, let's see here. Yeah, here is, uh, what color have I not used? Blue. Here was the net decline in investment. Investment dropped down to here, but then psh, it, it jumped back up some. So there's the net decline in investment. Notice it's the exact same size as the net decline in savings. Therefore, the net increase, I'm sorry, not net, I shouldn't say net there because it just, it, it, it only changed once. Uh, but the net decline in investment is exactly the same size as the decline in savings, therefore the exactly the same size as the increase in consumption. So you can show it graphically, actually much, in, in some ways more simply, uh, but um, I don't know, I, I hate to scare people in, uh, in, in uh, classes that haven't had you know, this background yet. All right, so there's that. And I wanted to read one thing to you before I finish off this particular lesson. Uh, you might be thinking, well, but I mean, surely nobody really believes that the economy automatically tries to get back to full employment like that. Yes, they do. And this is from Christina Romer, who, ah, there it is, who was the, uh, at one point, the uh, chief, what do you call it, the, the, the um, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under Barack Obama. And so therefore you would figure someone who was relatively interventionist as an economist working for a Democrat uh, rather than for a Republican where it might be more likely that they're thinking, well, leave the economy alone, it takes care of itself, all right? So, but even the Democratic chief of the uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors says this about business cycles. Um, oops. Just as there is no regularity in the timing of business cycles, there is no reason why cycles have to occur at all. The prevailing view among economists is that there is a level of economic activity, often referred to as full employment, at which the economy uh, theoretically could stay forever. So she's saying, yeah, it could stay there forever. Don't worry. Uh, the economy fixes itself. And this is from someone who is a left-leaning neoclassical economist. Okay, uh, I believe that's just about it for, for this. Uh, and and uh, next, if this is the video for Containing Perspectives, next uh, will be Marxism. And if it's, the, I'm going to use the same video also for uh, other classes where I go over the same concept. Uh, if it's for another class, we're not doing Marxism next. Okay, next big concept in post-Keynesian economics. Do you remember the neoclassical thing about if this is total savings, like I said, the households are over here, and this is total investment, the firms are over here. Uh, they have to be equal, first of all, savings and investment. And furthermore, the, uh, well, okay, not furthermore, let's say we start off with them equal and we're at full employment, but then for some reason firms decide to invest less, that could cause a recession. 
but that induces the financial sector to lower interest rates because they're still paying interest on this, but they're getting interest on this, and they don't want that. They, they, they don't want to be paying. Look at the gap right there. That's how much money they're paying interest on and not getting anything for. So they want to either raise this or lower this. And the same thing accomplishes both, and that is lowering interest rates. So they lower interest rates to raise investment and lower savings and until they're equal. And then what this does, not even by their intention, it makes sure we don't have a recession, or at least the recession is short-lived. The interest rates adjust and we're all saved. Um, Keynes said that ain't how it works. Keynes said it works this way instead. When investment falls, it causes a decline in their income. And when their incomes go down, their savings go down. So we just go into a recession, period. There is no automatic corrective mechanism. Uh, and that's bad, right? We need to do something about that. Well, uh, let me show you the explanation of how he comes to the same conclusion that... Oh, S equals I, but via a different route. Now, let's see here. Well, we're going to, just as we did before, we're going to deal with the y is equal to c plus i, uh, and, you know, um, well, that's all I need. Yeah. Uh, the total spending is equal to consumption spending plus investment spending. We're going to get rid of the government sector and of the foreign sector for simplicity. But we're going to talk a little bit more about consumption this time than we did under the previous model. And we're going to say that consumption is a function of total income. If this is consumption and this is total income over here, then you would expect that as, uh, as uh, total income rises, so would consumption. And Keynes said, yeah. And assuming we scaled both of these identically, initially, at very, at very low rates of income, you got to spend everything, all right? So if this says 100, that says 100. If this says, you know, uh, 40,000, that says 40,000. Over here, you're spending everything. But people would rather not spend everything. People, because the world is uncertain, would rather hold on to some savings even if they're not getting paid interest because the world is a scary place. So, As we get to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make it uh, sort of jump up at a steeper slope there, uh, but as we get to higher levels of GDP, so consumption per dollar of spending, uh, consumption per dollar of uh, income goes down. I probably shouldn't be doing so many of these videos in a row. I'm really tired right now. Um, the, uh, and, all right, so, so here's our consumption function. Consumption is a function of income plus sign. It's not a uh, stable, well, it's a stable function, but it's not a straight line. It's not a linear function. Uh, it flattens out as people have more income. And indeed, uh, in, oh, you know, really poor societies, I mean, they pretty much spend every penny they get in income, whereas we are able to save. Uh, and furthermore, even within the United States, the richest 20% tend to spend 60% of their income the other 80% spend about 95% of their income. So the, the poorer you are, the more you spend. All right, well, so we, we want to lay it out. And, and remember, if we're explaining consumption, we're simultaneously giving an explanation of savings, too, because those are the, uh, uh, the opposite extremes. I'm not sure what the dog sees. I hope it's the mailman, because I have a package I've been waiting for. Now, the okay. Uh, here's the problem with this, though. I can't make up. That's bothering me that it's not quite straight. Let me fix that. Yeah, that's better. All right. Um, the problem with this is we can't write a nice, neat equation for this blue line. So let's pretend we don't have the blue line. Let's pretend we have this line. Let's pretend we actually had that straight line right there. Now, why would, be, why would we be able to do that? Well, if we're dealing with an economy that's bigger than, say, you know, this big, well, then the red and the blue line are practically on top of each other, all right? So uh, if we're dealing with a relatively wealthy, developed economy, then the red line and the blue line are not far different. If we're to the left of it, they're really spreading apart there. 
Uh, but if we're not, if we're dealing with a developed economy like the U.S., well, then they're almost the same line, and we can actually draw a nice, neat, simple equation in that case. So, let's do that. This is that equation. B becomes the percentage of new income you tend to spend. If it was like, and it's, it's a macro concept, it's not just you, of course, but if it's 0.8, then that indicates that for every dollar's worth of increase in incomes, pe people spend an extra 80 cents. They save 20 cents of it. So this is going to show you how much people save versus consume out of their income. Uh, if it's 0 0.75, then for every dollar's worth of new income somebody gets, they spend 75 cents of it, and on like that. Can't be bigger than one, because this is a macro model. You individually can spend more than you earn, but the macro economy cannot. All right, so uh, this is a macro model, can't be bigger than, than, than one, uh, not going to be smaller than zero, probably not going to be anywhere near zero. And that's, this is going to be really important. All right, now let's substitute this equation into this one. Oh, I'm an idiot. I told you I shouldn't be doing so many of these videos in a row. But Lord, it's getting close to the semester start, and I want to get all this knocked out. Okay. That took the place of C, right? You put that in instead of C. Hey, now let's get all the Y's on the left-hand side. Now let's factor out Y. And now, let's divide both sides by 1 over b, or actually what turns out to be more convenient, multiply both sides by 1 over 1 minus b. Ta-da! You see it? Yeah. Uh, this bottom equation here is going to be really important. y equals 1 over 1 minus b times A plus I. And if you've already had macro, you're probably ahead of me on this and saying, I know what that is. That's the multiplier, or, or technically the income multiplier. Although, if you hear an economist just say the multiplier, they mean this one. Uh, but there is more than one multiplier. Uh, but this is the one that we generally just say the multiplier for. So what the, okay, so, so let me show what that number means. Uh, first of all, notice, well, no, don't notice anything. Let me show what that number means. Let's go with that uh, 0 0.8. B equals 0 0.8. And figure out what 1 over 1 minus B would be under those circumstances. 1 over 1 minus 0 0.8, which is 1 over 0 0.2, which is 5. All right? So the multiplier is 5 under those conditions. Which means that if investment goes up by a dollar, GDP goes up by five dollars. If investment falls by a dollar, GDP falls by five dollars. Um, real world multiplier going to be closer to two and a half, three, something like that. And uh, but you know, th 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 this is an easy example to do right here. That's bothering me. Let me put a zero right there. Uh, so you notice here then that if investment is volatile, as it's going to turn out to be. Its impact on GDP is out of proportion to its actual size. For every one dollar's worth of change in investment, whether that be up or down, we're going to get a more than one dollar change in GDP, and that's important because this number is very unstable. And so it creates instability over here. We rarely see big changes in consumption. Consumption tends to be, in, in this sense, consumption tends to follow Y. In, in, in fact, let's put it this way. Changes in investment tend to cause changes in income, which tend to cause the changes in consumption. We don't typically see recessions caused by people stop spending. We do see recessions caused by firms stop investing. All right? Because <clears throat> the uh, fall in investment causes the recession, and the recession causes consumption to go down. Anyway, that, that's just sort of a side point there. Uh, but I love this stuff, so I wanted to tell you. All right, so let's say we've got this, this five here. What exactly does that mean? How can it be that an increase of $1 in investment led to a $5 increase in uh, GDP? i, I got to be really careful focusing here. I better not do another video for a while. Um, all right, so let's see here. 
b is equal to 0 0.8, and 1 over 1 minus b is 5. All right, so what we should discover is that if we increase investment by $1, GDP should rise by $5. And this is how. Let's say this is our $1 increase in investment. TCU decides to add a little tiny horned frog on a chair in the new performance hall, which probably be more than a dollar, but anyway. Um, and so they raised the income of the, uh, of the company that sold the horned frog by $1. So their income went up, these people, because TCU invested, TCU added on a little bit something extra into the new performance hall, hall they're building, uh, and that raised income for somebody else, for makers of horned frogs. Uh, and so what do they do with their income? Well, some of it they spend. How much? Well, according to this, 80%. So, they're all excited and they rush out and spend 80 cents, all right, on, on whatever. Uh, so notice already, now income has gone up by $1.80. The initial entity's income rose by a dollar, but then that allowed them to go out and buy something uh, for 80 cents, so now somebody else's income has gone up by 80 cents. They only have 20 cents left, but they've got 20 cents plus a cool 80 cent worth thing that they have. So, so they still have the income. The, the, the income has been changed from dollars to something they bought for 80 cents. Uh, so and then the next, whoever this was here, they spend 80 percent. Oops, yeah, that's right, that's right. And so uh, they spend 64 cents and on and on and on, all right? So to, so to this point right here, incomes have risen by, I believe it's $2.44. Yeah, so far by $2.44, and we're not done. Whoever received this is going to spend 80% of that and on down the line. Um, and that's how the multiplier works. And guess what? It turns out that if you sit down with your calculator and you keep multiplying by 0.8 over and over and over and then add all the numbers up, you know what you get? Five. Uh, I actually did that one day because I love this stuff and I'm weird. So I sat down and got the back in the days of the calculator. Oh, oh my gosh, it almost is five now. It, it approaches five very quickly, by the way. And then you got little tiny increments that you're increasing by. So I don't know, like it gets to five, it gets to four dollars and ninety cents pretty quickly. But then after that, it takes a long time. Well, it takes till infinity, and I didn't have that much time. Uh, so. The, um, this is how the multiplier process is working and how it's connected to this propensity to consume is what this is called. The tendency to consume, right? Uh, and by the way, it's called the marginal propensity to consume. Remember the marginal uh, analysis from neoclassical economics? And remember Keynes was a neoclassical economist at one point. Uh, so he's using that marginal analysis that he learned as a neoclassical. Uh, so what's happening here is that the multiplier process is causing the initial increase in investment to be multiplied out to eventually be a much larger number uh, in the macro economy. So that's how the multiplier process works. Let's see, anything else about that before I actually lay out the model? I think that's all I wanted to do. Yeah, all right. Okay, so what? What does this have to do with savings equals investment and all that kind of crap? i got to double check the time here. All right, I got 14 minutes. Um, what does it have to do with all that? All right, so here's how we set out Keynes's analysis. Remember that one I showed you from the neoclassicals uh, on how savings equals investment? Here's Keynes's. So here's his three assumptions. And we've got y equals 1 over 1 minus b times a plus i. As I showed you a minute ago, I've made my bullet points too close together there, haven't I? Uh, we're also going to use this equation. And we're also going to use this equation. So what we want to find out, just as we did with the other example, remember we had investment, savings, investment fell, oh no, they're not equal anymore, Whoosh, they will be. Same thing will happen here, but via a different route and with a different conclusion with respect to whether or not the economy is in recession. So. Uh, yeah, the way to show this one is with a mathematical example. And by the way, you have to figure it out in this order. What we're going to do is I'm going to give you B, A, and I to start with. So that means we can calculate Y. 
Then once we've got Y, we already had A and B. We plug this in here, we can get C. And then once we've got C, we can figure out S. And we're going to check to see, is S equal to I? And it will be. So, check this out. I'm going to start with investment equal to 50. B is 0 0.8. A is 10. Is that all I need? Yeah. So, let's plug in that first equation. Y is equal to 1 over 1 minus 0 0.8 times 10 plus 50. There's A and I, and there's the B right there. Let me jot that down for you. B, A, and I. And if you multiply that out, that's 5 times 60, so GDP is 300. Well, I want to wonder how much consumption was. Well, let's see. C is equal to, uh, and I'll just plug the numbers in here, 10 plus 0 0.8 times 300. 0 0.8 times 300 is 240, 250. How much was savings? Well, savings is income minus spending, minus consumption. 50. Mon Dieu, as they say in economics classes in France. We started off with investment equal to 50. If we went through the calculations, I'll be danged if savings doesn't also turn out to be 50. How about that? So, they're equal. All right. Now let's go back to the scenario we had before. Let's say they're equal and we're at full employment. So everything's awesome. But investment's gonna fall. Inve investment's gonna fall from 50 to 40 in my next part of my example. Uh, let's see, I think I'll try to draw it over here next to it. That means I'm gonna have to roll my chair. Well, no, I'll just get out of the chair. All right. um, let's see. Now let's lower investment to 40, and let's see if it's still true that investment ends up equal to savings. And is it the case that total spending stays the same? Or are we going to have what Keynes said, total spending actually falls? Right? And total spending, of course, was 300. So do we stay at 300, or do we fall away from that in the process of returning to S equals I? Well, let's find out. All right, so this time investment's equal to 40, so let's plug all those numbers in here. Um, y is equal to 1 over 1 minus 0 0.8, 10 plus 40. All right, so now we've got 5 times 50, 250. When, uh, sometimes it tries to focus on me, and, and who can blame it, uh, rather than on the board, but I think that's legible enough. Uh, then let's figure out consumption. Can't figure out savings until we figure out consumption first. Consumption is 10 plus 0 0.8 times 250. And it turns out that 8 tenths of 250 is 200. So that's going to be 210. Savings is equal to 250 minus 210. Because 250 was total income, Consumption was 210, and like magic, they're equal again, all right? So investment fell, but they're equal again. So the process by which they re-equilibrate is the fact that income falls, investment falls, driving down income. Uh, and therefore driving down savings until they're equal again. So this kind of sucks, because now the overall level of economic activity is no longer 300. 300 was getting us to full employment, by assumption. We said, let, let's, let's start at full employment. 300 was getting us to full employment, and now we're at 250. Our new equilibrium is 250, which means we're not at full employment anymore. So that's the point Keynes was making. He was saying, look, there is no, not only is there no, no automatic mechanism in the labor market, but also that loanable funds theory that created this automatic mechanism at the in interest rate, that doesn't operate either. This is what really happens. Uh, and in fact, it's a lot more complicated than that, uh, which we'll get to some of it here in, in a little bit. Uh, but that's the basic story. And let me... I was thinking about doing this. What time is it? I have to be somewhere at 4, which is downstairs, but <laughs> uh, it's 8 minutes to 4. Uh, and let's see. Now, nah, I'll, I'll hold off on that. I'll hold off on that.
Okay, so now we've got some money supply stuff coming up next, uh, but otherwise, we're rolling, baby. We're rolling.